Uh, every class I do a Bible verse. Um, Where's my clicker? Oh, there it is. At the beginning of class, and uh, it may be a verse you're very familiar with. It may not be, but I want us to work on it together to make sure you. Uh, and that that letter, you can just take it home and have your parents read it. Uh, or you can read it. You know, there's nothing wrong with you reading it. It just gives you all the information you need to know. And I'll talk more about our class in just a minute. But let's look at the verse first. Y'all recognize this? If you confess, confess with your mouth, with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Lord and believe, believe in your heart, heart that God, God hmm? raised, raised him from the, the dead, dead, you will be, be saved. saved. Yeah. It's a hugely important verse, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. I'll talk more about the Bible Memory Club later too, but that would be a verse you can quote to me. Even if you quoted it last year, you can quote it again. And uh, if, if you if you're interested, but uh, I want to talk about this for just a minute. Confess means to to admit to say this is the truth with your mouth. So you're saying this it's true. You say it with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. Now I want to talk about Jesus being Lord for just a minute. First of all, the word Jesus brings different things to different people's minds. Some people, when they hear Jesus, picture a Jesus that really isn't the Jesus of the Bible. Oh, hold on a second. No, I've already got that done. That's right. I thought of something else I needed to do, but I've already done it. They'll, they'll, they'll picture a Jesus that's kind of the Jesus of their imagination. They've made up a Jesus. For example, just to use a really extreme example, there's some people that say, oh, I love Jesus, but they believe that Jesus was just a man who died and stayed dead, uh, just a man like anybody else, and they think he was a great teacher or something like that. That's really kind of nonsense, but there's some people that want to believe that. And, and so they've got the wrong Jesus. They've got somebody in their head that they call Jesus, an imaginary Jesus. So it's really important that we know who Jesus is. And Jesus... T tell me a few things that come to your mind about Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. I mean, just doesn't have to be complicated. And that he was raised from the dead. Yeah, he was raised from the dead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, three days after he was yeah, crucified. He was, yeah, he was crucified, and three days later he rose from the dead. That's the most important thing you can say about Jesus, I think. Yeah. Anything else come to mind about Jesus? He's the greatest teacher. Greatest teacher that's ever been. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else come to mind? No. What about... Uh, his beginning. That's a trick question. I didn't, I didn't hear you. Have you? He was born as a human, but also he's always been. Yeah, yeah, you gave a full answer. That's good. He was born in Bethlehem as a baby. That's what we usually think of as the beginning of Jesus. And yet, we know that that wasn't when he began because he didn't begin. He's God, which means he's eternal, which means he became a man when he was born in Bethlehem of the Virgin Mary didn't have a human father. God was his father. God the Father. And that gets us confusing too sometimes because God re reveals himself as three persons. He's one God, but he's three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God the Son. He was with the Father from the beginning. That's how John starts his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus, and the Word was with God, with God the Father, and the Word was God, God the Son. So, so anyway, we know who Jesus is. Now, what about this word Lord? You know, what comes to your mind when you hear the word Lord? Leader? Leader, creator, mm -hmm. world of the okay. world. Okay, good. Those are good answers, too. The word Lord, in, in the Greek, in the New Testament anyway, has two different connotations. You know what the Old Testament language was? The original the Old Testament language was written in? Hebrew. Hebrew. Except for some chapters of Daniel which were written in Aramaic, which is like Syriac, which they spoke in Syria. And they spoke Aramaic in Jesus' day in Israel. I mean, in Judah. Well, Capernaum. I mean, Galilee and Judah. Anyway, um, <laughs> but in the New Testament, it's a different language. You remember which one it was? You know what the New Testament was written in? Greek. Greek. So Hebrew and Greek. In the Old Testament, God gives himself many, many names, but he has a primary name, the main name of God. And in Hebrew, it's pronounced something like Yahweh. Have you heard that? Yahweh. Which we will sometimes transliterate into English as Jehovah. Yahweh, is, that may not sound the same, but that's the way they transliterate that Hebrew word, Jehovah. But in your Bibles, most of the time, 
you will see that the, God's primary name as L-O-R-D with all four letters uppercase, capitalized. Capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. Lord. So this is God's primary name, Jehovah, Yahweh, Lord. In the New Testament, all those places that trans when it quotes the Old Testament, the New Testament has lots of Old Testament quotes, and when it uses when it uses God's name, it uses this word right here, Lord. So this is one way this is one way that the New Testament teaches us that Jesus is God. Now there are many other ways where it says very explicitly he's God, but he's saying that here, Jesus is Lord. He is Yahweh, he is God, the eternal God. But the Greek word Lord also has an additional meaning that you were pointing out earlier, which means leader or boss or the one in charge. Uh, you know, he's the one that tells us what to do. He leads us. And so what I'm doing when I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord is, first of all, making sure I've got the biblical Jesus in my mind, not some imaginary Jesus, and that, I'm, and that I've turned my life over to him. You are the Lord. You're God, and you know what's best for me, and I want you to be in charge of my life. I surrender to you. I want you to be my boss. I want you to lead me. That's what it means to confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. And, of course, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you have any doubts about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, uh, we cover a lot of that in uh, Warriors of Christ. And we spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, how we know that Jesus really did rise from the dead. So I uh, hope you can take that class or we'll take that class at some point. Very important. But when you do that, he says, you'll be saved. Saved from what? Well, Save my sins and the consequences of our sins. Sin leads to death, destruction, hell, damnation, condemnation. Fill in the blank. You know, God saves us from that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He paid the price for our sin so that by trusting him, we could be saved. And that's what this verse is teaching. So it's a very, very wonderful and awesome verse. Now let's see if we can memorize it. If you confess with your mouth, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Can you get started? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that, if you believe in your heart that the Lord is creator. No, that's close. You got the first part right. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. What? God raised him from the dead, you will, be saved. you will be saved. So you just about got it memorized. So that would be a great verse to add to your Bible Memory Club verses. So memorize it and quote it to me on your own, and I'll give you credit for it. Okay, awesome. Now, let's see what all I want to share with you guys about. Um, I don't think I need to go over rules and stuff. You know about rules. and You won't have any problem following the rules. Um, I have taught ACT prep for many years. I taught it at Telco Plains High School before I taught it here. And from the very beginning at Teleco, we made it a pass-fail class simply because students are at different levels of math. Some people would come in there and all they'd had was Algebra 1, and some people would come in there and they've had Pre-Cal. And so it's not really fair for them to have the same test, you know. And, I, and so here it's even more, I think, important for me to spend all the time we have on giving you tips and helping you work through a lot of ACT type problems, and I'll help you with it. But uh, I'm not going to give you any tests. You, you can you can get a practice ACT book. You, have you already got an ACT book at home of some kind? No. You, you can get one if you want. You don't have to have one, but it'll help you get ready for the ACT. And you can pick one out. I don't care. They're all pretty good as far as I can tell. They, I've looked at several of them, and they all usually have some sample problems from real tests and tell you how to work those problems. And you can do that on your own. I don't feel like it's good. With Teleco, I used to give a kind of pre-test. I'd, I'd take the first several days of school to do pre-tests. But here, since we only meet two days a week, we got two hours a week, less than two hours, really, I feel like I'm not going to, that's too much time. So I'm just going to focus on what you need to learn. I'm not going to give you assignments. We'll just do everything in here. You will learn as much as you put into it. That's what it amounts to. If you sit in here and just kind of let it flow, <laughs> okay. I mean, I've had students take ACT prep because their parents said, you need ACT prep. You're going to take it. I don't want to take it. You're going to take it. Okay, I'll go. And then they sit. And <laughs> they don't get much out of it. So it doesn't help their ACT score. But if your desire really is to bring up your ACT score, 
then you will find this to be helpful stuff. And if you'll just work on it and make, apply yourself, you'll find a lot of helpful stuff. So, uh, and I forgot to say this also. This year, uh, I have asked Melissa to give me one hour a day where I don't have a class so I can meet one-on-one -on -one with students. I think it's really important. Um, last year, I had wall-to-wall -wall classes, and I wasn't able to do that. And I feel like I'd like to meet with as many students as I can, hopefully everybody by the time the year's over, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I've got a period from at 1 o'clock, right after chapel or right after lunch, at 1 o'clock, that I can meet with you. And I have also can meet with you at, uh, we're, we're doing our class at 3 o'clock, is that right? 3 to 3.45. 3 to 3.45. So after 3.45, I can meet with you. And then uh, I could meet with you during the lunch period, I guess, if you wanted to do that. And I will. I don't know how I'm going to do it exactly. I may do it alphabetically. I don't know, but I'll, I'll just decide. I'll probably go through my classes first, and then in other students and other classes later. Uh, and but if between now and the time I meet with you, there's something on your heart you'd like to just sit down and talk with me about, either to help you pray about or help you think through, I'll be glad to do that too. You know, we'll set that up. Just let me know. I forgot to tell you that earlier. Okay. Let's see if I'm remembering or forgetting anything else I need to cover. I gave you the handout. I gave you the, uh, the uh, uh, letter, I mean, and the questionnaire. Uh, I do videotape and put on YouTube all our class meetings if I can think of it. <laughs> and I did think of it today. And uh, uh, you'll be uh, welcome to watch them on YouTube, if you think there's a concept that you think would probably help you if you spend a little more time on it, you know, you can go back and watch it again. Um, and I'm going to give you this lesson plan, but I'll be honest with you, in ACT prep, I don't feel hung up with this lesson plan since I don't give you assignments and I don't give you tests, but it just gives you a, kind of an idea of some of the things we'll be covering. But, uh, you you know, don't hold me to it. I may go a little faster or a little slower or, or even change my mind and skip over to something else. So we'll... Uh, because of the nature of this class, that's 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 what we'll do. Do you have any questions for me right now that you can think of? Anything on your mind that I'm not thinking about? I, don't. I have one that's for Algebra 2, not now. Okay. You want, you want to just wait till then, then? Or, or? Oh, I was going to ask, if we finish it like in minimum and Bob, because I have you at that class as well, if we finish then, or does that mean we'll start earlier in Algebra 2, or we just start exactly at 3 every day? You you mean? Wait a minute. Like if we were, if you were to finish teaching early in that okay. class or something. I've got, I've got men and women of the Bible, and you're in that class. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Okay. Yeah. I I yes, let's play that by ear. I I may, uh, I may occasionally say, Cole, I need a few minutes here to get some stuff together before we teach out of two. But 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 probably by and large, it would work just to go ahead and launch. But don't count on getting out early. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to I tend to use up the whole period, you know. Yeah. I tend to use it up. Okay, and I've never taught that course before, so we'll see how that goes. That's going to be an interesting thing for me to try. Okay, that's a good question, though. Anybody else have a question before I? Okay. Now I want you to have a piece of paper, and uh, right now you won't need it immediately, but you'll need it in a few minutes. A piece of paper and a pencil. And you're not going to be turning stuff in. You're just going to be trying to convince me that you're really taking this seriously. <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, when I say work this problem, and, and we may not even get there today. I don't know. We'll see. But if I, if I say I want you to try this problem, I want you to really try it. Okay? And even if you don't know what you're doing, pretend it's the real ACT and you're messing with it to see if you can come up with a clue or something. You know, maybe make the best guess. You, I'll talk all about that in a minute. But, but at least have your paper and pencil ready. But here's just an introduction to the ACT in general. You know what it stands for, ACT? Anybody know? You know why you don't know? Because it really doesn't stand for anything anymore. Uh, I, I, I've usually said that it stands for the Agonizing Catastrophic Tribulation. So <laughs> that's how most students look at it, I guess. But originally it stood for the American College Testing Program. American College Testing Program. That's that's what they called themselves when they first started giving the test. And then it's kind of like KFC. You know, it's always Kentucky Fried Chicken, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then they decided, no, it's KFC. Well, everybody knows KFC stands for Kentucky Fried Chicken. 
Well, this kind of stands for American College Testing, but they don't say that officially anymore. And I don't know if that's because they want it to be thought of as a worldwide thing as opposed to just American. I don't know. But anyway, that's the deal. How important is it? Well, it depends on where you're going to go to school. Here are two different colleges and, uh, and things that are important to them. ACT, GPA, you know what that stands for, right? Great grade point average, yeah. What, in other words, your your high school courses, your average in your high school courses and grades. And personal, you know what that would include? Like um, personal achievements, stuff like that, mm -hmm. community service. Yep, yep. Some kids are involved in some kind of sports or calisthenics or athletics or cheerleading and all that kind of stuff. That's personal stuff. Some people are involved in church activities. You know, you've worked in, in church groups and, and been involved in church activities. And some of some people sing in the choir and those kind of All that's personal stuff that they would count. And, and you're right, community service, those kind of things. Uh, if you've done something personal on the side, like a hobby, you know, hobbies are sometimes very interesting and, and, they're, and, they, and they're sometimes very educational. You might have a hobby of some kind that you work with, work with something. You know, maybe some people work with computers or work with cars or work with uh, whatever, I don't know, boats or something. Anyway, that's the personal stuff. Now, this represents two different kinds of colleges. Do you want to guess where I'm going with that? About which college is which? On the left, wait, what, like the exact college? Not the, not the exact college, just the type of college. There's a type of college that would tend to be interested in you this way. There's another type of college that would tend to be interested in you this way. The one on the right is a more academic-based college. Yeah. And the one on the left is more, it could be like art school, trade school. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Okay, that's good. Uh, and the one on the right tends to be go with with the really big schools, like University of Tennessee. Some of these major campuses have thousands and thousands of students. They don't care too much about your personal life in general. Now they might, like you said, if you're in a sports program, they, they want to know about that maybe. And, and, it, and it depends on what you're doing there. I'm not saying they'll be totally, but in general, they're more interested in your ACT and your GPA. But especially some of the smaller Christian schools and private schools and schools that want to get to know you as a person, they really care about this. You know, that's, that's really important. If you, and a lot of students like that atmosphere better. You know, we, who is it we partner with? Bethel? I, I think, you know, they would kind of pride themselves on being this way, I think. You know, they're interested in you personally. You like to sing? They want to know that. You know, they, 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 you know and I, I like that atmosphere myself. But, uh, but the big universities, you're, you're kind of impersonal. You get lost in the crowd. I, I went to the University of Tennessee, and I felt like a number most of the time. You know, it's just one of the crowd. So there you go. Yep. <clears throat> okay. A good score on the ACT, it just depends on what will get you in the college of your choice, so you have to research it. And nowadays, that's fairly easy. You can usually go to the internet and see whether they require the ACT, if they so, what, if so what, what score they require, and what difference it's going to make. Like for scholarships and things, you probably a AC, good ACT score will make a difference in getting scholarships, maybe other advantages. So you just have to research that on your own, depending on what you're interested in. Do you know what you have to score on the ACT to be in the top 10% of all the students who take the test? Do you know what the, the, the top 10% represents? You have to make a 27 or higher. How did you know that? I just guessed. <laughs> I'm really good at guessing yeah. and predicting, so. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> 27, yeah. Uh, that may vary a little bit from year to year, but in general, you make up 27, you'll be in the top 10%. So 27 is a really, really good score. That's the point. Yeah. Um, you get a that's a good question, too. You know, that is. 36 is the highest you can score. I've had one student in my lifetime that made a 36 all the way across. He was one of my students at Telco Plains, Joe Bivens was his name. His sister was a little older than he was. Oh, shoot. Her name's not popping in my head right now, but anyway, she she was a little older, so I had her in high school before Joe came along, and I, and she was one of the best students I'd ever had. She was a really, really brilliant kid, and she said, "Oh, my brother's a lot smarter than I am," and I thought she's just trying to sound humble, but <laughs> she said, "No, she doesn't mean that." But when he came along, I I had him in several math courses, including ACT prep, and. Uh, 
and, and I don't think he ever made anything but 100. I mean, he's just that kind of kid. And he's made a perfect score on the ACT. I mean, that kind of kid. He went, by the way, he went to, uh, he went to Texas Tech. I haven't kept up with him. It's been several years ago now. I'd like to know what he's doing. I, I might have to kill me if I find out what he's doing because he went into cybersecurity as well. He was interested in that stuff. And he was really good at it. I don't know what happened to him. But anyway, he's a brilliant kid. Yeah, 36 is a maximum. Anything in the 30s is incredibly good. Uh, <clears throat> five tests make up the ACT. The English test, 75 questions. Do you want to guess all this? Let me just tell you. <laughs> time allotted, 45 minutes. I can't remember all this all the time myself either. Do you happen to remember the math part? How many questions? No. Uh, this is the first time I've even yeah. done all that's this. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's pretty close. 60, 60 questions in 60 minutes. Yeah. It's easy to remember because it's 60 and 60. Now, in those variations for English and math, is it some of those are like you can do them in less than 30 Oh, yes. Some yes. Some of the math questions, you, I'll, I'll explain all of this, but some of the math questions, you can look at it and you'll know the answer instantly. Same with reading. It's kind of like... Yeah, and English especially. I mean, 75 questions, you only got 45 minutes. You've got to move pretty quickly. We'll talk about that, but, but it's... Yeah, you you gotta you gotta answer fairly fast. However, in both English and especially in math, there'll be some problems that you got to struggle with a little bit. That it's intended to be that way. Some of them are pretty tough, and so you want to get as many of those easy ones out of the way as you can first, and then got got as much time as you got left to struggle with the hard ones. Yeah, reading forty questions, forty thirty five minutes. Oh, so they did divide reading up into two parts, or English and reading are separate. Yeah, English and reading are separate. I'm sorry, English English is more about grammar and syntax and word you know, subject verb agreement and and uh, pronouns and adjectives and those kind of parts of speech and that kind of stuff, uh, and also writing things concisely and that sort of you know. And reading means you're reading a section of material and answering questions about it. What? Well, yeah, comprehension. Yeah. Science reasoning is very similar to reading, actually, except, uh, and, there, and there are 40 questions and there are 35 minutes on it also. The science is a part that terrifies a lot of students when they first look at it because they've got these weird-looking graphs that just look bizarre and scare you to death. And, and, but when you start looking at the details, you realize, oh, oh, I can, I can figure this out. It looks more complex than it really is. It's designed to scare you. <laughs> but, but uh, and there's some reading to do on the science as well. Writing, most people don't take the writing test, but it's just you're writing an essay and you've got 30 minutes to write it. If, if you're going to go into a school where you're going to focus on journalism or something like that, or, you, know, you may have to take a writing test, but most schools don't require it. Now that's what I'm saying right here. Optional means optional for the colleges. That's the writing test. Uh, you pay an additional fee. It's like a, almost a separate test. Each test scale to 1 to 36, writing 2 to 12. They average up the four scores that you get on each of the four tests and get the composite score, and the writing is separate. It doesn't count with the composite. Are there decimal scores on the ACT, and if it's below 0.4, they keep it as is and just round it down? Yeah, I think that's the way they do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you, have you heard the phrase super score on ACT? Do you know what that means? Um, I think they still use that term super score. But if you, let's say you take the ACT right away. And let's say you did, uh, you made a 27 on the English and a 25 on the science and a, and a 24 on the reading and an 18 on the math. Well, the math is pulling you down. So what you, pro what you might want to do, this is what a lot of students do, is they say, okay, I'm going to take it again, and this time all I'm going to do is focus on math. I'm not going to worry too much about these others. I'm satisfied with those scores, but the math I want to bring up. So you try your best to bring up your math score, and then when you're done with those two tests, they'll take the highest of each and give you a super score. So they take my, if, the, if those first three were higher, they take those three, and then the math score from the second test and average those four scores together. That's what's called a super score. So that'll bring your overall up. Yeah. And a lot of schools will do that. Here's a little question just to help you think about how you get ready for the ACT. If you only had one hour to study in the final week before the ACT, would you spend it on your strongest subject or your weakest? Yep. It is. 
But do you know why? Would it be your stronger suit? Yep. The reason why is because if you are doing your weakest, then you're going to struggle with trying to get your weakest up. Right. So if you do your strongest, you're going to become even stronger. It's like in the gym. If yeah. you lift the 50 pound when you only can lift five, you're not going to get anywhere. But if That's you lift right. 50 pound when yeah. you're yeah. bulking up, you'll be yeah. better. Yeah, exactly. So. That's good. good analogy, and it's, and it's, a, it's, it's exactly right. Uh, what what will happen is, especially if you only got a little bit of time. That's why we said final week. Uh, <clears throat> you know, okay, I've, it's a week before the ACT. I've never studied trigonometry, but I'm going to learn it now. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> not in a week. <laughs> you know, it's just too much. Uh, so it would be foolish to say I'm going to try to learn trigonometry. Now there might be a few little things about trigonometry that are fairly easy that you could learn, wouldn't hurt. But uh, but it's better, you know, to say okay, I'm pretty good at uh, at English, or I'm pretty good at geometry, or I'm pretty good at algebra one stuff. So I'm going to do some of those problems just to kind of brush up and bring it all back to my mind. Uh, but if you tackle something that you just don't know much about, it's just going to frustrate you and make you feel kind of overwhelmed and not and, and, and panicky and negative, <laughs> just discouraged. So you, you you know you got to review those strong things as well. Yep. You'll hear me talk about this a lot, POOD, personal order difficulty. And that simply means that when you're looking at a set of problems or a set of questions, uh, let's say, let's just at random say that we got 10 questions we're looking at here. And you scan those questions, you know, one of you might say, well, I, I know number one and number three and number seven. I know those are easy. I'm going to do those. And somebody else might say, well, I know number two and six and 12 or 10 or whatever. I, th those are easier for me. You, you, and, and some of you might say, I have no idea what number four is talking about. I'm going to skip it or, or choose the letter of the day, might put a C in there or whatever, because I don't have a clue what they're talking about. And then somebody else might say, well, I understand that one, but I don't understand this one. You know? So you just have to decide what, what's, it, what's hard for you. And the ones that are hard for you, you learn how to, if you can, eliminate some really bad answers. We'll talk more about this too. But if you if you if you can't, you say, okay, this this one's out there. I'll maybe get, learn about this for the next test. But then just guess a little bit of a day. Always do the questions that look easiest for you first. And I already said that different people do better on different types of questions. So you can think of it this way. This is not official or anything, but you can sort of think, okay, some of these questions for me are easy. Some of them are sort of medium and some of them are really, really hard. But you got to remember, no matter whether it's easy, medium, or hard, it's all the same as far as the scoring is concerned. So you don't want to spend all your time doing a hard problem when you could have done three or four easier problems. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So you want to make sure you you don't uh, miss the easy ones. These are for you. It's, it's Don't ever leave anything blank. There's, you don't lose points for wrong answers on the ACT. It's very rare nowadays, but have any of you ever taken a test or heard of a test where if you mark something wrong, you will make a lower score than if you just leave it blank. Have you ever had a test like that? I've never had a test like that. Mm. Maybe TCAP, but... I don't remember if TCAP was that way, and I don't think it was. But but uh, they did used to give, uh, they'd have math competition tests that some of our students at Teleco would compete in, best students from different schools. And they would have uh, this math exam, a really tough math exam, for the best students in each of the subjects from different schools. They'd go compete. And in that test, they would do that. They would say, if, if you don't have a clue, don't guess. Just leave it blank. But if you know that one answer is wrong, your average, your probability of getting, a, getting it right is better to go ahead and guess if you can at least eliminate one, one choice. But on the ACT, you don't have to worry about that. It's just put an answer down. They're not going to count off if you... It's not going to hurt you to have the wrong answer down any more than it would to leave it blank. If you leave it blank, you're definitely going to miss it. Yeah. And if you put one in there, you put an answer in there, you might have a chance of getting it, and it's not going to count against you. Is there a partial credit in such thing as the ACT, or is it yes or no? It's either right or wrong. It's either right or wrong. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so, if you get a tough question, it's especially true on math. And you, it's very common for students to struggle with this. They'll, they'll run into the first hard problem, and they say, oh, I've seen that before. I think I might be able to figure out how to do this, and you start messing with it. But time's ticking by, 
and you mess with it and you mess with it and you mess with it. You might finally figure it out, but then you, the, the clock dings before you've got about 20 more questions to do at the end of the test. And, oh, what have I done? You know, and you might have gotten some of those right, too. They tend to put the easier ones up front, but that's not always the case. There are problems that you can probably do that are pretty easy toward the end, too. <coughs> so on the math test especially, this is not true of the English test. It is true of math and science and reading probably as well. Do the easy things first. And the hard things, skip them and come back. If you think you might be able to figure it out, you can mark them. I'll say this a lot more during this year. But you can mark it. Say, I think I can figure that out later. And if you have time, go back and look at it. Meanwhile, if, if, it, if you don't have a clue, check your letter of the day. You with me, Isaac? You with me? Okay. Check the letter of the day and just say, uh, I'm just, I'm just going to. Forget this one. I don't, I don't know this one. It's all right. It is timed. You must manage your time well. Don't just race through the test. This is why it's good to take practice tests and maybe take the real ACT more than once because you get a feel for how to manage your time. Obviously, it's better to only try 30 questions and get 25 correct than it is to try 60 and get 20 correct because these are the only numbers that matter. So you don't want to go so fast that you're making a lot of careless, foolish mistakes and not thinking at all. You know, you don't want to just go in there taking quick guesses. But at the same time, you do want to get through if you possibly can. You want to at least look at all of them so you have to learn how to manage your time. So when you're taking the test, you'll probably work... Uh, any questions that look quick and easy and obvious immediately. You don't, you don't skip it. You don't come back to it. You don't get those out of the way. But some of them <clears throat> that you think I might be able to figure it out, you, you'll mark it and come back to it. Get these out of the way and then come back to these. And then some of them you'll say, I don't have a clue what that's about. Guess the other day and forget it. So that, that's, that's an important strategy. Process elimination, POE. Anytime you can tell an answer is wrong, mark it off. They're just distractors. That's all they're there for, to try to keep you from picking the right answer. So if you know it's a distractor, scratch it out so you don't even look at it anymore and, and choose between what's left. First pass. Understand the problem, do it. <clears throat> don't quite understand, but think you can figure it out, circle it. Come back to it after the first pass. After there's no clue, guess the letter of the day and move on. I've said that over and over, but I'm just trying to underline this. Hey, what is the letter of the day? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure this is really true. But here's the logic behind it. ACT people will tend to suggest that you pick a letter, like the letter C. And anything you absolutely don't know, choose C. Every time, C, C, C. Now, by the way, C used to be what they always told you to tick on a multiple choice test. Because when, when teachers made up their own tests, more teachers chose C for the correct answer than A or B or D. When they make up their own tests and choose one of them. But nowadays, very few teachers make up their own tests. They're all computer generated so it really doesn't matter what the letter is so here's the logic uh, if you if you assume that the answers are distributed evenly between a b c and d which is a good assumption and you choose a, you go down through that market number one a number two b number three c number four d number five a you see so i'm doing this circle for a b c d there's at least a possibility you could get them all wrong but if they're distributed evenly and you're guessing just one letter all the way through, then you ought to always get at least a fourth of them right. Now, that's the logic behind that. I'm not 100% sure it makes that much difference because the probability of you guessing on any one problem, the right answer is one out of four. On a math test, one out of five. Five choices on a math. So I'm not sure it matters that much, but that's where that letter of the day comes from. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It does kind of make sense even though it's hard to put a name Yeah, place. yeah, yeah. It, 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 and it does. It is. It is logical. But I'm not sure when you talk about the mathematical probabilities that there's much difference. But 
it's at least conceivable that you could miss them all that way, and it's not really conceivable if you check, check one, you know, so, so, that's why we call it letter of the day. Start on problem, got stuck, circle it, move on. Th this is important. You know, you need to somehow in your back of your mind have this internal clock going on, and you can say, I'm spending too much time on this, I'll circle it and come back. I, you know, it's, it's taking too much time. Because if you, if you spend too much time on it, uh, it can get you in trouble. Oh, and you may have experienced this before. Uh, sometimes when you look at a problem and you try to think it through, and you're, you're, you're making your mind, mind grapple with it, but you can't quite figure it out, and then you go on, and then you come back later and say, okay, oh, I remember how to do this now. And, you, and, and it comes back to you. It's like your subconscious is kind of working on it while you're working on something else, and it pops back in your mind. I've done that with words that I couldn't think of. I mean, you know, like a test, and there's a blank spot. I'm supposed to fill in the blank with a word. And I think, oh, man, I ought to know that. I ought to know that. I'm thinking about it. I can't, can't get it. I go on through the test and come back. Oh, I remember. And it pops back in my head. So your subconscious will sometimes help you out there if you get come on the second pass okay uh, this is a few years ago obviously but uh, if you did half the math problems you'd get a 21 you got half the math problems right you get a 21 in 2016 I need to try to update this if you got uh, let's see science 19 or 20 is half of them you get a 20 Am I looking at that right? Yeah. Okay. English, half of them would be 36 to 38. You'd get a 16. You'd get a lot more than half the English questions right to get a better score. And science, 19, 20. I'm sorry, reading. This is science over here. Both of them the same. 19, 20 gives you 19. Half of them, half the reading problems would be a 19 that year. Okay. Now you don't need to see that. That's going back way too far. You need to take that out. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, now I, I used to do this at Teleco. I'm not going to do it here. Just never mind that. Um, takes too much time. There are 215 total questions on the ACT, all four exams. If you put your head on your desk and sleep through the test and turn in blank answer sheet, you will get a zero. Because <laughs> you just didn't get anything right. If you go down through the guessing letter of the day on everything, you'll probably get about a 12. That's not good. So somehow you want to... I mean, it's better to put something, though, than nothing. 12 is better than zero, but that's, that's, you don't want to do the whole test that way. So if you use process elimination and eliminate obviously wrong sources, you'll bring that up, 12 up a little bit. But obviously you have to know some stuff to make a good score. What's the French word for eggplant? Any of you know enough French to tell me what the French word is? <laughs> I don't either. Here are the choices. What would you choose? Don't. French isn't a language that uses symbols to talk, so it would be C. Right. So that'd be an LTD yeah, yeah that, that's, there you go. And, well, it wouldn't be LOTD, but it would be uh, uh, guessing, eliminating bad answers. Uh, uh, letter of the day, if the letter of the day is B, you would miss it. But, but, uh, so it just depends. But, but most of you realize, hey, the French use the same alphabet we use. You know, if you've had any French at all or studied French or seen any French words, they use the same alphabet we do. So A, B, and D are obviously eliminated. It's got to be C. Now, I'm not saying they would give you a question like that, but it's still a good illustration of eliminating obviously wrong answers. You know? yeah. yeah. What's the capital of Malawi? And here's, you probably don't know that. Well, here's some choices. New York, Lilongwe, Paris, and Kinshasa. Malawi? Uh, that's not a U.S. Uh-uh. That's not in the U.S. So that's right. You know it's not New York, don't you? I mean, you know the capital of Malawi is not New York. That's a POE question right there, I think. Yeah, that's, that's process of elimination. That's right. Okay. And that's what the last so, one was, too. And what else could you probably eliminate? Paris? Paris, yeah. Paris is the capital city of France, 
The capital of Malawi is not Paris, though. You know Paris is the capital of France. Now you don't know which one of these, probably. Those are both, all of them are weird names. Malawi, Lingonwe, and Kinshasa. Is it B? <coughs> Was it, what? Is it B? Yeah, why would you choose B? Really, in this moment, it's just because it looks similar to it. It does, doesn't it? They both end with a W something there. You know, the we and we, you know. That, that, that looks like that ought to be it. And I, I, that's, that's how I think, too. And that's really good thinking because that's just the right answer. Uh, but at least, even if you didn't notice that, at least you could eliminate half the answers and have a 50-50 chance of getting it right, you know. So that's what the process of elimination is all about. Yep, yep, yep. Not before the test. Don't stress yourself out by cramming, especially on the really difficult things. Uh, it might not be a bad idea to uh, just do a few practice problems. If you're not prepared, relax the best you can, do the best you can, say I'll take it another time. I didn't study like I should have, but just do the best you can. Try, your, try to stay relaxed. Stressing out doesn't help. Uh, if you have prepared, just relax and have a little more confidence that you've done the best you could to get ready. Morning of the test, eat breakfast. I'm telling you, it really does make a difference to eat breakfast. It really does. It'll give you some more energy. It'll make you feel less sluggish. Eat like your grand breakfast. If, if you eat too much, you sit and eat too many pancakes, you may find yourself wanting to go to sleep before the test is over. So I would eat, but I would eat a, a, a decent breakfast. Uh, Probably get a protein and everything. Yep, 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 yep. Many lose their will to live about two thirds of the way through the test. <laughs> okay, Lord, I'm ready to die. <laughs> this is awful. But especially if you know the, the breakfast will help you. Take a snack with you. You'll have a break, and you can eat your snack during the break. And there'll be people around you who'll go in crazy and just try to ignore them. <laughs> try to keep yourself calm. Remember your admission ticket, your photo ID, plenty of sharpened number two pencils, a watch, an acceptable calculator, maybe some calculator batteries. You could probably replace your calculator batteries before you go. And make sure you're not going to have a problem that way. It'd be a shame for your batteries to ruin it. Yes, yeah, yeah, charge it up before you go. Yeah, 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 make sure it's fully charged. Yep, yep, yep. You may also want to do a few ACT problems that you've already done and know how to do before you leave home just to get your brain kind of working, you know, do, do a few math problems, get your brain used to it so it's kind of warmed up. <clears throat> Make sure you know where the test center is, get there a little early. Testing room may not have a clock. The proctor is supposed to tell how much time is left, but he may not. Uh, and you can use your own watch for a timer, but you got you can't use a beeper. They'll 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 get upset with you if they hear a beeper going off. So, uh, any of you ever taken the ACT before? Have you taken it? No. no. Okay. Um, when you get there, use the bathroom just before the test. Again, that can drive you crazy if you feel like, oh no, my bladder is full. I've been drinking too much coffee, and now I can't go. You know that kind of stuff. That's, that takes away your focus. Make sure you have uh, plenty of light. You can see clearly, and that's probably not going to be a problem. Your desk is not wobbly. If you happen to be in a, a place where the desk is wobbly, ask the proctor if they can give you a steadier desk. They should be able to do that for you. I don't think that would drive you crazy, too. Or they might be able to put a piece of paper in there and get it stable or something. I don't know. Put paper. Don't be tempted to cheat. Don't let others see your work. I try to cover up my work as I go because it, it, they have been known... If two, you know, the computers, of course, can compare these tests, and if two innocent people, if, 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 if two people's tests look very, very similar, they correlate beyond normal probability, they may ask both people to retake the test. That's been done before. And you may be innocent. You may have any idea what it means. It may be your the friend next, next to you has been copying your answers down, <laughs> and, and, uh, and now you've got to take it again because they cheated. So you just want to be careful there. Obviously, you want to be careful you're marking the right problem on the right place. It helps because they've given different, they, they skip a row of letters, but, but uh, especially when you skip problems, you've got to be sure that when you come back, uh, or when you skip them, you skip the answers too. You know, you don't want to write the answer in the wrong place in the answer book. You've got to really pay attention to that. Okay, I'll stop there. Anything you want to say, add, talk about? Nothing? Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for these kids. 
I pray you'd bless them as we continue to look at ACT stuff this year. Help them to uh, learn what you want them to learn and to get prepared as well as they can be prepared to take the ACT and to do well on it. Help them to take the course seriously. Help them to work hard, not to be lazy brains, but to make themselves think and try their best to get these things figured out as we go along. Pray you'd help us all the rest of this day to bless you, to be sensitive to other people around us, to be encouragers, to be good listeners, but most of all, to bring you glory, whatever that means. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.